Mark chapter 15. The title of my message is Jesus Paid It All. Beginning in verse 15, I want you to follow with me in your Bible. Mark tells us that immediately in the morning, verse 1 of chapter 15, that they held a consultation. This was the Jewish authorities. He has been arrested in the garden. He's been tried before Caiaphas that Thursday night. They held a consultation with the elders and the scribes and the whole council, and they bound Jesus and they carried him away and delivered him unto Pilate. The Jews didn't have the right of execution, so they are going to take him to Pilate. They have found him guilty, according to their law, of blasphemy because he said that he was the Messiah, the Son of God. So they're taking him to the Roman authority, Pilate. And so Pilate asked him, verse 2, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answered and said, Thou sayest it. And the chief priest accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. And Pilate asked him again, saying, Answerest thou nothing? Behold how many things they witness against thee. But Jesus answered nothing, so Pilate marveled. Which is interesting because Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 7 tells us that he was led as a lamb, dumb before the slaughters, and that he opened not his mouth. So God had spoken through the prophet Isaiah about this very thing. In verse 6, it says, Now the feast, at the feast, he released unto them one prisoner, whomsoever they desired. And there was one named Barabbas, which lay bound with them, and had made insurrection with him, and had committed murder in the insurrection. The multitude crying aloud began to desire him as he had done unto them. But Pilate answered them saying, will you that I release unto you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priest had delivered him, that is Jesus, for envy. But the chief priest moved the people that he should release Barabbas unto them. And Pilate answered and said again unto them, what will ye then that I do unto him who is called the king of the Jews. And they cried aloud, here it is, crucify him. Then Pilate said unto them, why, what evil has he done? And they cried the more exceedingly, crucify him. So Pilate, willing to content the people, he released Barabbas unto them and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. And the soldiers led him away into a hall called Praetorian, and they called together the whole band. And they clothed him with purple and plaited a crown of thorns and put it upon his head and began to salute him mockingly and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him on the head with a reed and they spit upon him and bowing their knees, they worshiped him. And when they had mocked him, they took off his purple robe from him and put on his clone clothes on him and led him out to crucify him. And so they compelled one Simon, a Cyrenian, passing by, coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. So they bring him unto the place called Golgotha, which being interpreted as the place of the skull. And so they gave him to drink wine mingled with myrrh, but he received it not. And when they had crucified him, they parted his garments, casting lots upon them, what every man should take. And it was the third hour, and they crucified him. The third hour is a reference to nine o'clock in the morning. Jesus hung on the cross for six hours, from nine in the morning till three in the afternoon. So beginning at nine in the morning, Christ was hung upon the cross after being beaten, whipped, scourged, and mocked. And so it says the superscription over his head was the accusation written, the king of the Jews. And with him crucified two thieves, one on the right hand and the other on the left. And the scriptures might be fulfilled, which saith, he was numbered with the transgressors, citing Isaiah 53 and verse 12. And so they passed by, they reviled him, and they wagged their heads. They were saying, ah, thou that destroys the temple, and you build it in three days. Save thyself, come down from the cross. Likewise, also the chief priests mocking said among themselves with the scribes, he saved others, himself he cannot save. Let Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. 
And they, were, they that were crucified him reviled him. And when it was the sixth hour, now it is twelve noon, there was come a great darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, three in the afternoon. So three hours of darkness. I believe that darkness was universal. And some of them that stood by when they heard it said, Behold, he's calling for Elijah. And one ran and filled a sponge full of vinegar and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, Let alone, let's see whether Elijah comes and takes him down. Then verse 37, Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. And the veil of the temple was ripped from two in two from the top to the bottom. And when the centurion which stood over against him saw that he had so cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. There are four facts about the cross as we've read this narrative that I want to bring out. If you're taking notes, I want to write them down. They're simple, but they're not simplistic. The depth that is in the cross cannot be explained with human language. God in his word, a divine revelation, has explained the cross and its implications for us. But I think that there's divine mystery and depth there that we could never fully understand or comprehend. But the first fact about the cross I want to mention is that the cross was the planned in the mind of God. The mind of God planned it, you might say. Write down Acts chapter 2 and verse 23, where Peter was preaching on the day of Pentecost. And Peter said these words, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by wicked hands, have crucified and slain. The mind of God planned it. I believe in eternity past, before Adam and Eve were ever created, before they ever disobeyed God and fell into sin in the Garden of Eden, before any of the prophets spoke in the Old Testament, before Christ was ever born, that God planned the day that he would actually bring the Redeemer into the world before sin ever entered the world. It didn't catch God by surprise. God knows all things. One of the exciting attributes of God is what's called his omniscience. That means that God knows everything. So there's nothing outside of God's knowledge. And this is why I say the mystery that we don't understand why God allowed sin to come into the world. It was brought by man's own rebellion and free will and disobedience, but God had a greater plan to be able to redeem man so that not only did he create man, but he redeemed us, and he redeemed us by the blood of his own dear son. And I think that when we get to heaven, there's going to be understanding about the redemptive cross of Christ. We're going to be singing about Christ our Redeemer, and we're going to understand things that we don't understand now. The Bible says, now we see through a glass dimly, but then we shall see face to face. Now we know in part, we prophesy in part, but then we will know all things. So God's going to reveal some of these deep mysteries. But you can mark it in your notes, the mind of God planned it. God had it planned out before the foundations of the world. The second fact I want to point out is that the Word of God promised it. We've already seen that in this passage. Many of the passages of the prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament that predicted and prophesied that the Messiah would come and suffer and die. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, which is seen as the first messianic prophecy right after Adam and Eve fell in the Garden of Eden. It says, the seed of the woman would bruise the head of the serpent, and that the serpent would bruise his head, the head of the seed of the woman, it would bruise his heel. So there, there is a reference to the death of Christ and the crucifixion of Christ. The Messiah would come as the seed of the woman, speaking of his entry into the world through the womb of the Virgin Mary. And then when he died on the cross, he would actually be victorious over not only sin, but over Satan. He would defeat the devil. The Bible tells us that at the cross, that Jesus divested Satan of his power. He's defeated the powers of hell. There's also Isaiah 53, verses 3 through 7, where it says, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And by his stripes, we are healed. 
So the mind of God planned it and the word of God prophesied it. And those are just a few references of many references where God prophesied the Messiah would come and he would suffer and die upon a cross. But the third fact about the cross I want to mention is that the love of God provided it. The love of God provided it. Write down John chapter 3 and verse 16. Yes, John 3, 16, the Bible in miniature. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That word begotten doesn't mean that he was created. It means that he is the greatest one, the highest one, the one of preeminence. His only unique son would be a good, good translation that whosoever believes in him would never perish, but have everlasting life. What a great verse. God's marvelous love, sending his only unique son, that he would die on a cruel cross and pay the penalty for man, the creature's sin. What a great statement about the love of God. How great is God's love. So we have the mind of God planned it, the word of God promised it, the love of God provided it, and then thirdly, or fourthly, the Son of God paid for it. Mark chapter 5, or Mark chapter 15, excuse me, and verse 39. The centurion that was standing at the foot of the cross, so near to the cross, can you imagine actually standing at the foot of the cross? thinking maybe even the blood of Christ dripping upon you. The creator hanging on a cross of wood. Someone said he hung upon a cross of wood, but he made the hill on which it stood. The creator of all things, the giver of life, dies for man's sin. And as this man watched this, this strong Roman soldier, he said, truly, truly, this is the Son of God. Now when Jesus died... It tells us in verse 37 of Mark 15 that he cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. Now, he doesn't tell us what he cried with a loud voice. We know that seven times he uttered his voice upon the cross. But the last two statements that Jesus made, and he does it victoriously. So Jesus died on the cross vicariously for us in our place, but he died victoriously he said with a loud voice, he said, it is finished. We know it as tetelestai, or some translations have paid in full. That's the title of my message, Jesus paid it all. When he died on that cross and he cried out with that loud voice, Jesus said, it is finished. What is finished? Atonement has been made. Reconciliation has been provided. God the Father has been propitiated or satisfied in the death of his son, Jesus Christ. So Jesus said, I've come to redeem, I've come to satisfy the law by dying on the cross, and I've come to pay for man's sin. And when he cried to tell us, die, it is finished. It reminds us of the truth that there's nothing more for us to do. We don't have to work, we don't have to deserve it, we don't have to merit it, to try to be good enough to get to heaven. So many religions, a matter of fact, all other religions other than Christianity teach that you must do something to be saved. You must work hard or reform yourself or be a good person, hope that your good works outweigh your bad works. But Christianity, and only Christianity says, not do, but done. It is finished, paid in full. So the only thing that's left for you and I to do, let us remember this Good Friday, is to enter into that finished work of Christ by faith, to receive that free gift that God gave us by faith. And that's how that gift is received. Now, there's one more utterance that he made on the cross as he died. It says that he said to his father, Father, into thy hands I commit or I commend my spirit. And Jesus voluntarily bowed his head and dismissed his spirit. Jesus said, no man takes my life from me. I lay it down to myself. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it up again. So when Jesus bowed his head and dismissed his spirit, he had dismissed his spirit into the Father's hands. How glorious a truth is that. 
Now, the gift of God is a gift that provided in the cross. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. Remember Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. By grace you have been saved through faith. And it's not that of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So the cross is God's gift of salvation. It is God reaching out to us. Remember Jesus saying, Come unto me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He's calling for us to come to him and to believe upon him and to put our faith in him. Jesus paid it all. All to him we owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but Jesus, when he died on that cross, washes us white as snow. Let's pray.